Michael Snow is one of the most influential and widely known of experimental filmmakers. He has made films since 1956, and a complete retrospective takes place at Canada House in London this month, together with an exhibition of some of his artworks. In February, this goes on tour to Birmingham, Sheffield, Bristol and Nottingham. Michael Snow's films extend from a brief four minutes to an extraordinary and encyclopedic work of four and a half hours. Widely seen throughout Europe and North America, they tend not to be seen in conventional cinemas, but at film societies, film clubs, in colleges, and at art galleries and film festivals. <laughs> it's also, it's very intense sort of looking, isn't it? Yeah, quite... yeah. But I'm in the light and you're not, actually. So it's like I'm, was... I'm sort of seeing mm. you through, um, you know, because you're really in the, in the dark, <laughs> you know? On a first encounter, Snow's films can seem frustrating to eyes conditioned to the action, the actors, the imaginary worlds of a more conventional cinema. They can seem frustratingly empty. So empty do they seem that on occasion audiences have been tempted to riot. On the other hand, I would suggest it's a question of new visual pleasures. They can be witty, frequently. They can be lyrically beautiful. They can also be astonishing and challenging to our conception of what cinema can be. You've always been very active as an artist and as a musician. How did you first get involved in film? <clears throat> the way I got into film was uh, that I had uh, an exhibition of drawings, the first exhibition I, I ever had. <clears throat> and uh, I heard from someone who saw this exhibition who asked me if, he, if I wanted a job. And uh, he said that uh, he saw the drawings and he thought that whoever had done those drawings would, must be interested in film. If I was, uh, was I interested in a job doing animation? And it turned out to be George Dunning, who later was in England uh, and uh, directed The Yellow Submarine, the, the Beatles film. And he, he, he and a couple of other people who had been at the National Film Board started um, a film company in Toronto. Anyway, I got a job there and that was my introduction to film. And before that, I hadn't been especially interested in it, in fact. You moved from Toronto to New York in the late 60s. This seems to have had a remarkable effect in terms of your commitment to film. When I went to New York, I soon discovered um, the filmmaker's Cinematheque, <coughs> which was basically organized by Jonas Mikas. And I then also discovered uh, the small a number of people who were making so-called underground or experimental films at that time. While I had made a solo film before I went there, uh, the fact that one could alone or independently make a film was, was really Im Im impressed on me by the, ac the activities that I came into in New York. And I think that that's one of the most radical aspects of so-called experimental film for many people, which is that one person alone can make a film which can be as powerful and as, as important and as a film made for millions of dollars by, with a you know, cast and crew of thousands. It's, uh, it's a very important aspect of, of, work, of working independently uh, of the industry, uh, <clears throat> that a, a, uh, a film can be made like a poem. You know? Wavelength, a 45-minute zoom down your New York studio space, 
is still perhaps your most critically acclaimed and notorious work. People who are seeing this now are not seeing the film, and, and it's, it's being retranslated, in a sense, into uh, television. Uh, and all of my films try to use um, the essential nature of the medium, and especially in wavelength, I was trying to concentrate on the fact that the material is light, and that what one shapes when one makes a film is, is light and time, although obviously time itself cannot truly be shaped. That's an illusory thing, but one does work with durations. But at any rate, in this case, the, uh, the fact that it's modulating the light itself in a, in a lot of different ways, changing the, the quality and color of the image and all that sort of thing was, was a very big part of, of, of Wavelength. But even, th there's really a lot to it. I don't know how I could summarize it, but uh, the, just the projection situation itself, which is that um, uh, what you see on the screen is an enlargement of, of single photographic images. Uh, repeated in quick, quick succession on the screen was something that I tried to, to, to bring out. Wavelength works with a, what I, in my own private thinking about my work, have thought of as, as types or kinds of belief. Um, <clears throat> and any representation in that film of, for example, the room alone is an illusion. There is no room. When the room is peopled, so to speak, it becomes a different kind of belief. Um, and in the kind of scale that I was working with, which applies to every aspect of it, from, on the one hand, pure color light, that is just a single color or just white light even on the screen as one kind of cinematic event. Modulations of just color on the screen can be our events in a film. See, if you, if you watch, for example, in Wavelength, if you, if you watch the image of just the room for a long time, it becomes quite abstracted because the, it, you start to sense, perhaps subconsciously, that it is only two-dimensional. <clears throat> but when, for example, in the beginning, the bookcase is delivered and people walk the entire length of that space, it's, it it's becomes a, a convincing illusion of three-dimensionality. And that was the, the one of these of, of the of the of the scale that I was trying to work with or one extreme of the of the scale so and for example the death uh, could be considered and I thought of it then as being a, precisely a transition from from the stage of, of mobility and of of, of um, making a representational space that's convincing to joining the objects essentially that are depicted as static the furniture and, and that's what a, what a death is. And when, he, when the man dies, the camera continues, it, it's the camera's always moving, the zoom actually, the lens is always moving forward, the image is always narrowing down, and it, it passes him. And it makes, it's an event that, ha, that has become a static, it's a stopped thing, like a photograph. And later on, there's a reference back in time towards, to, to that death which is now behind you in space and time. It's almost like it's in the back of your mind by, the, by that time.
this room. I just got here. And this man lying on the floor. And I think he's dead. It, it, it's essential that you know if you make films that what you're working with is durations and that what you can control, what you, first of all, as I said before, what you do is modulate or shape light. But <clears throat> film is, is, is marvelous amongst the, in the arts in that you can work with very specific lengths of time. Your individual unit is 1 24th of a second and you know when you have in your, in your hand this, you have a, you have a second or you have two seconds or whatever. And uh, it, it's, it's really quite precise. In fact, it's more precise than any other uh, medium. The musical analogy in discussing film is a very, very useful one because um, they're, they're both time arts. They exist in time. And musical composition involves arranging um, sound elements um, in temporal relationships, really. And I think if you um, approach film from that point of view, it's every bit as valid as the, as the uh, story or narrative uh, approach to it, which is a valid one as well, because that's also a development in time. I don't know how it would work out numerically, but most films are narrative, and, and they, they, their, their development depends on, on a story. And there, I think one of the things that I'm doing and one of the things that a lot of experimental films, filmmakers are trying to do is to make other kinds of developments in time. And uh, it's a very, very rich uh, field of um, inquiry or of uh, aesthetic discovery. The film you made in, in 1971, La Région Centrale, or Central Region, would seem to extend this principle of, of working with time. It's a film that lasts two and a half hours. Um, Actually, it's three hours. Oh, it's three yeah. hours. <laughs> um, which is filmed in the wilderness of, of Quebec with no people at all. Um, I mean, why is it so long, I suppose, is the, is the simple <laughs> answer. <laughs> it's longer than you thought. <laughs> it's not very long. Three hours is not, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and I think uh, in that, the case of that particular film, if one felt it, it was long, I think that would be, it would be successful, because the subject is, uh, is planetary motion. It's about the Earth, and, it, and you know, I mean, not only about the Earth, but um, <clears throat> it's, uh, sex, it's kind of compressed sections of a, of a day so uh, since it's only three hours, it's not, it's not 24 hours, but um, if it had a feeling of being long, I think that would be, I would consider that to be, um, that the film was doing what I wanted it to do. In, for La Région Centrale, <clears throat> once I started to visualize what I felt was necessary, I wanted to make a landscape film, and it, the kinds of motion that I started to feel were necessary were related to the subject. Uh, <clears throat> but what I wanted to do was to, um, to be able to move the camera in a completely spherical sp space. Uh, and just a simple way to introduce that is that um, vertical pans, as far as I know, are never done. I've never seen them. <clears throat> Which is to say that when you, you start like this, suppose it's a landscape, 
you're aiming at the horizon. When you move like this with the camera, coming back down here, it's upside down, the image is upside down. And then as it comes down here again, it reverses itself. And it's really an, inc an, an incredible, there's a lot in just that vertical pan that's, uh, um, well, I think there's a lot more in it, you know, but I kind of, I got into it, into its possibilities in my regional central. But that's only one of the, what I wanted to do was to be able to move the camera <coughs> without photographing its mount to try and find some way that, to be able to move the camera, first of all, in any kind of, of um, circular movement like that, but also to move the camera itself centered on the lens so it could swivel. You can't do that. I mean, obviously, it could swivel like this. And the com make the combinations of those movements could do kind of Mobius strip things, uh, all kinds of circular movements. <laughs> Région Centrale is, uh, is a very definitely a motion picture. <clears throat> there are no holds in it. It's all continuously panning. Um, <clears throat> and um, one of the lines of the work, the work that I've been doing has been an inspection, I guess, of camera motion for one thing, but really in, in it's bigger than that in the sense that it's a, it's, a, it's a look at the vocabulary of possibilities that there are in, in this particular medium and, to, and an attempt to bring out the content that's latent in, in these techniques, perhaps you could call them, uh, so that they don't disappear in their use, which is perhaps, quote, normal. That's to say uh, that panning, for example, is used to follow some action. And you're not supposed to think about panning, basically. You're supposed to follow the action, because uh, in, a, in a lot of cases, a, drawing attention to panning would be to take the spectator out of the illusion. <coughs> uh, and that is how mo narrative films, for example, stand or fall, that is, on the, con on the verisimilitude on the, on the convincing aspect of the illusionism. But what I've been trying to do is to, to make a, what I think of as, as a more purely filmic experience by bringing out the content that's latent in such things as zooms or pans. Um, so that, that they're not lost, but they're, 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 they're seen. <clears throat> and um, La Région Centrale was part of the line of this, this kind of work, which came from, it's really, it's really pretty organic kind of evolution. I, I made um, Wavelength, then a short film, Standard Time, which was the first one where I tried circular pans and found out something about the effects of, of circular pans. And then I made uh, Back and Forth, and La Région Centrale was, was a development out of that because I started to realize that the camera was limited in its, in its, in its movements by its the essentially what's an, an imitation of a, of a human viewer <clears throat> that is tripods are, are set up so that they stand at five to six feet and they swivel in the way our heads swivel but the, the, the I, I wanted to to be able to move the camera in a totally spherical space to be able to, to make it completely turn in all kinds of ways that a, that a stand-in human couldn't and perhaps to bring out some of its uh, possibilities, you know, the, the, the camera as a, as, a, as a tool.
all my films, except for uh, Two Sides to Every Story, were made for an audit auditorium or theater situation where you sit down and the, and the works have um, beginnings and endings and have development and so on. But I have tried to do a few things, one of which is slide length, sections of which you see behind me, <coughs> which are gallery works. And uh, Two Sides to Every Story is a, is a two uh, projector film that's a gallery installation. And uh, it came from thinking about the two dimensionality of the image and trying to make that uh, an experienceable aspect of the, of, of the work. Two Sides to Every Story was, was an attempt to, to make a, a you know, thoroughly two-dimensional image that would, you could walk around. What it is, is uh, uh, it, was, it was filmed with two, two cameras exactly situated around certain actions which were um, composed or scripted. Uh, and so in, in, in the film or the installation work, you see both sides of, of the action. Um, and you can't see them simultaneously, you have to walk around the screen. The films we've been looking at so far don't seem to make a great use of language. I made um, a film uh, called um, Rameau's Nephew by Diderot, thanks to Dennis Young, by Will Michonne, uh, which is quite long. It's a four and a half hour film. And it's um, uh, a film that was really trying to work with, um, with recorded speech. And to try to, among many other things, it's, a, it's quite a complicated film, to, to make an experience that relates to the kind of experience that I talked about with, with Two Sides to Every Story. That is, to be able to hear recorded speech, people talking and so on, as recorded. To be able to have, on the one hand, the power of the complete illusion that uh, when you see that a head on the screen and the mouths move, uh, or, uh, or heads on the screen and the mouths move, that you believe that the, there is a person there and that they're speaking. On the other hand, there's something possibly quite powerful about knowing that there is no person there and that that speech is not speech. That's just as my speech at this moment is not speech. It's a, it's, it's been altered by becoming a recording. And uh, there are kinds of, of feelings and ideas in directing the spectator's attention to the nature of recording uh, that I'm trying to work with. And I did in Ramo's Nephew, uh, I, uh, and it had to do with, with language on the one hand, but also with to, to do with speech. And of course, so is this, is, a, is, is totally reading. Uh, there's no sound. It's, uh, it's a silent film. So it's about language, but um, basically it's a way to, to control, you know, or to form reading in the, spe in, the, in the spectator's mind.
what's being done is that um, certain things are being put in your memory uh, in a certain order, and then um, there's a de continuous development that in some ways refers back to the structure that's accumulating in your mind. Uh, and since it's built, the units are, are single words, one after, one after another. It's a, uh, it builds up memories of a particular kind, of a particular kind of form, and as the whole thing continues to, to build, you gradually, I think, see the structure appear, the structure that's of the film, of the experience. Um, does that make sense? <laughs>